Hi everyone, imagine having the ability to live forever with endless time stretching out in front of you. We are always saying we don't have enough time, but would longevity offer ongoing joy and great experiences or would it strip our lives of meaning? If we achieve immortality by switching bodies or uploading our minds to the cloud, do we retain the essence of who we really are? Keep watching as we dive into the philosophy of extended lifespan and immortality. This video has three parts. Why we want to live longer, are you still you, and influence of new bodies. Part one, why we want to live longer. This video is the second in a series of three that I'm planning to make about immortality. The first video was about biological immortality, our own bodies living longer through an unaugmented sort of way. And if you want to watch that video first, I'll put a link to it up here. The third video, the one after this one, is going to talk about how we could augment our human bodies, for example, through nanobots to achieve longer lifespans. And in this video, we're going to dive into the philosophy of it all. Let's get started. Immortality is a funny sort of goal to pursue. It might make you sound like a supervillain to say you might want to be immortal. And I I think it's an interesting duology in our culture where we think that seeking immortality is wrong, is evil even, but healing and medicine is actually good and it has a similar effect of expanding your lifespan but it's still finite, whereas immortality implies an infinite lifespan. I think this is because aging and death is seen as part of the natural order. Almost all living things experience aging and eventually die to make room for new organisms in the ecosystem. So trying to cheat death seems like an unnatural thing to do. So so why might someone want it if they're not a supervillain? What would immortality really grant you? Of course, it grants you extra time to do more of the things that you want. However, I would say that humans are not particularly good at managing time, spending it on things that really matter, judging their priorities correctly. So I'm not sure that in itself would make a qualitative difference. Because fear of death is really built into most organisms, if you feel like you are immortal, then that gives you some freedom from that fear that would otherwise be present. I think life often feels like you only have one chance one opportunity to take life by the horns and make something of yourself. And feeling like you have all the time in the world would really take the edge off. Actually, it reminds me of kids that I've known from very wealthy families that don't really have any serious concerns, kind of wandering through life looking for things to do, looking for things to keep them occupied. So sometimes having that edge is a good thing. It's what pushes us to strive to achieve. But there is still that promise of having time stretching out in front of you with no limits. And that in itself is valuable. Assuming, of course, that you're in good health, living an expanded lifespan or living forever is only good if you can capitalize on it by not experiencing ill effects of senescence, for example other potential downsides. Like I said, when people say they want more time to enjoy life, it could mean that they're not good at time management. So allowing them to do more of the same might not resolve their life satisfaction issues. To me, and to many of my viewers that commented on my previous video, it seems possible that people would go crazy or eventually get bored if they're starting to live for a very long time. And there is something to that, because we tend to become less flexible as we age, less willing to embrace change. It becomes harder to learn, so there's a strong incentive to just rely on your existing experience. That's an essence for you or the side effects of aging. So again, if you could live forever or live for a long time, but still be in very good health, I'm not sure how much of an issue this would really pose. But it's still an interesting question. And if you didn't answer last time, I'd like to pose it to you. Would you want to live forever or just for an extended period? And what would you do with that time? Part two, are you still you? Philosophers in ancient Greece posed a thought experiment called the ship of Theseus. This was a very famous ship to the Athenians. So they kept repairing it, kept it in good shape. And the question is, if this went on for centuries, such that every plank of wood in the ship, every piece of the entire ship was eventually replaced by a new component, is it still the same ship? You could say that because the changes were done gradually, that the ship was still the ship even after you replaced one board and then the next board and so on. So the idea is kind of shifting over time, but the ship is still the same as the original ship. Or you could say that the original boards and planks that formed the ship were actually the essence of that ship. And as you were taking them off and throwing them to the side, you were slowly removing the original object. There's an expansion to this thought experiment where suppose you take the boards that had been removed from the ship and you eventually formed an entirely new ship out of all of those discarded boards. Now is this ship the same as the original ship of Theseus? In the first case you have a continuous existence of an object even though those component parts are getting replaced and in the second instance you're saying that the original planks and boards are actually the most important and even if the ship got disassembled and then reassembled again at some later date it's still the original object. I'm inclined to believe that at least when it comes to humans and consciousness the first interpretation is probably true. The ship even as it has had many different boards replaced is actually the same ship at the end of the day that it was in the beginning. You can draw a parallel to the cells in the human body. I've read that all of our cells actually get replaced every seven to 10 years or so. So you're living in an entirely different body every decade. There's one exception there, which are the neurons, the cells in our brain, which 
are all created when we're born and last for a very long time. You can imagine an instance of the second interpretation of the ship of Theseus though. Suppose you're in Star Trek and you get teleported from one point to another. You're actually the same component parts that have been disassembled and reassembled. Are you actually the same person? I don't know and we're not talking about teleportation right now. So let's focus. Let's consider the question. If you transfer to a new body, like a clone of yourself or a digital upload of yourself, is it really still you? And going back to this ship of Theseus example, I think if it's a gradual process, if you're conscious the entire time, then the new entity is you, whether or not any of the original parts still remain. Consciousness is interesting. We are basically systems of information that can take inputs in, send inputs out, systems that are aware of our own existence and that evolve slowly over time. I think actually that property of continuousness when it comes to consciousness might be almost essential for it to arise. If you think about it, babies aren't really conscious, but then when you grow up as an adult human, you are conscious. So there is a slow gradation involved, a slow evolution of consciousness as your system, which is yourself, started to recognize its own existence. We can lose memories, we can lose body parts, we still consider us to be ourselves. Of course, no one has proven what consciousness really is. And in this video, I'm going to make the assumption of physicalism, which is the belief that consciousness arises from the physical arrangement of particles in your brain and in your body. It's like I said, you can start in an unordered state as a baby and eventually you can evolve over time and consciousness can arise. Physicalism states that there's nothing special going on. There's not necessarily a soul or anything that you can't measure. So if you were to be able to replicate all of the physical atoms that exist in your brain somewhere else, that the consciousness would also be present there. Of course, I think it has to be a gradual transition if you want to experience yourself, the feeling of first being in this body and then being in that body. An abrupt transition is more like a clone. You could probably say, yeah, that other person is conscious, but I don't feel like I am that person. You could also have a lossy transition where not all of the information that used to be present in your mind is there at the end of the transition. That might be a bit like getting old or getting dementia or something like that. And depending on the severity of that degradation, I would think that a lossy transition is not necessarily going to preserve your notion of self and consciousness. So what does this mean for mind uploading, which is everybody's favorite way of achieving digital immortality? Doesn't there have to be a breaking point, a discontinuity in your experience of consciousness when you hop from a biological body into a digital one? A lot of people seem to think so. For example, Jeffrey Hinton said, we've already invented immortality. It's just not for us. We can make immortal beings like AIs, but we can't take our own brains and consciousness and stuff it into the machine. However, I don't know if that's true. And we'll talk about that more in the next section. But basically, if you can achieve this sort of gradual transition, then you might actually be able to preserve that subjective experience of consciousness of being in this body and then being a digital upload. The last point that can stretch our definition of self is that if you exist as a digital upload, there's nothing to prevent multiple copies of you from being made and multiple copies of you from actually running. So presumably the original copy would have a contiguous subjective experience, whereas copies or clones would feel like they had been the original all along, but then suddenly there'd be this jump in their memories and they would wake up in a new body. If you like this sort of thing, you should definitely check out the book, We Are Legion, We Are Bob, which talks about Bob, the first self-replicating von Neumann probe that kind of goes out into the universe and ends up making lots of copies of himself. I want to point out one silver lining though. If you're actually a digital entity that can be copied, that means you can make backups of yourself pretty readily as well. I'm not sure what happens when you re restore yourself from a backup. It's probably a lot like being a clone, right? You experience a dislocation in yourself. So does that mean you're not the same person? I would argue that you're not really the same person anymore, but that you might think you are. And that might be good enough for the ship of Theseus. Part three, influence of new bodies. You may have heard of the technological singularity, which is the point at which technology starts to invent technology. Or in other words, technological progress is driven primarily by artificial intelligences or digital intelligences, uploaded minds, for example. And it's called the singularity because it's really hard for us to see beyond that point. And just as a reminder, Ray Kurzweil predicts the singularity will occur around 2045. Anyway, as we approach the singularity, we're inventing tools of ever increasing complexity that expand our thinking and processing power. The first example of this is just the smartphone. You can use a phone to keep track of things for you, to look up information. You don't have to store the information in your head. You can store it on the phone or you can remember where to find it on your phone and that's good enough. As we start to have AI assistants, we're going to start offloading more and more cognitive capabilities to them. And if you want to think about it, our sense of self, our consciousness is actually starting to expand beyond our own body. And as technology accelerates, we'll even start to construct new bodies for ourselves. We already have avatars in online games. We'll eventually have virtual reality that's almost indistinct 
indistinguishable or completely indistinguishable from the real world. We might have robotic bodies as well that are built out of nanotech. Why commute to the other side of the globe if you can just temporarily take over a body there, walk around for a bit, and then come back to your home before lunchtime? So we're going to become more and more familiar with having multiple bodies. It's actually a concept in neuroscience called body maps. Part of your brain ends up modeling your own body and your sense of physical being. And actually the most sensitive parts of your body, which are your fingers and your face, take up the biggest space in this body map because it's really your brain's way of processing sensory information and so on from that part of your body. These body maps are highly dynamic. If you're a violinist and you play notes with your left hand, then the body map portion of the, your left hand is actually going to expand. I'm speculating here, but I think that perhaps when you get an injury, like say I hurt this finger on my hand and you go through your day and you stop using this finger for everyday tasks and after a while it just becomes natural. I imagine that's a temporary adjustment to your body map. Same thing when you have much more serious injuries, like you might lose an arm, for example. Ideally, that portion of your body map can go away and you can use that brain space for something else. And when that doesn't happen, you end up with those phantom limb sensations because your body can't see the limb, can't use proprioception to notice where the limb is. And that part of your brain is just sitting there saying, hey, what's happening? So I'm talking about all of this because I think that when you start having multiple bodies, especially bodies that you use habitually, that those bodies will start to feel like part of yourself and you'll eventually start dedicating brain space to them in your body map. We already see this with online games where people start to relate to their digital avatar. There have been some studies on that, but I haven't looked into it in detail. So combine this familiarity with new bodies with the extra processing power that comes from digitizing intelligence. The digital part of your mind, which right now is just the smartphone and will eventually become AI assistants and will eventually beyond that become your thinking literally outsourced to the cloud or not outsourced, but rather merged with or incorporated with because we can't really expand the size of our brains. We can't really stuff more neurons into our skulls, but we can build more and more compute capacity in the cloud. And as long as your brain can talk to that capability effectively, it'll eventually start to feel like part of your own body and the digital part of your brain will grow exponentially and it will eventually dwarf the original biological part of your brain. And you'll probably be able to do crazy things like shift memories from your biological brain into the cloud where they can be stored with higher fidelity and not change every time you access them. By the way, if you take all of the information that we've ever heard as a human, that ends up only being about one terabyte, which is quite a lot of data, but you can rent one terabyte of data for about $5 a month today from the cloud. So that should give you an idea of the scale of some of the capabilities we're gonna have when we can use that compute and we can use that storage as if it's literally part of our own minds. Finally, when you're in this state with your mind partially in the digital world and partially in the physical world, and also partially used to being exposed to multiple different bodies, you'll actually be able to simulate the loss of a body by disconnecting yourself from that temporarily and seeing what it feels like, seeing what's missing. If you're temporarily disconnected from your tourism body that's halfway around the world and you can't access some of those latest memories about what things looked like, you're probably not going to be too concerned, but you could actually simulate the loss of your biological body by temporarily disconnecting yourself from that and seeing what that feels like. It would feel very weird because you would basically split yourself and then rejoin your consciousness, hopefully not developing schizophrenia at the same time. But the point is your digital mind could think and see what am I still missing and then reconnect to your body and make sure to take that information, take those experiences, whatever is needed and make sure that that is in your digital self as well. So that is how I think you can achieve a mind upload without experiencing any discontinuity in yourself. In other words, your consciousness is probably going to go from being completely in the human body to completely in the digital body with no gaps in between, which means that all of us might actually get a chance to see what it feels like to be a digital immortal. Finally, in conclusion, we talked a lot about what it means to be immortal and whether immortality would give us what we actually want. And we explored the example of the ship of Theseus to decide whether or not we are actually the same person after parts of ourselves get replaced and changed. And in my opinion, the answer is yes, we are the same person if there are no discontinuities in experience. We also talked about the ways that having multiple bodies might impact us, how our brains can adapt to that situation and how we might use that to eventually upload ourselves to the cloud without experiencing a discontinuity. Stay tuned for the next video in this three-part series, which I will link up here when it's available. And that video is gonna do a deep dive into mind uploading, the technology behind it, and how far along we are to achieving it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and please do share this channel with a friend that you think might like it. And if you have an idea that you'd like to see me cover, leave the idea in the comments below. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.